Good morning. My name is Ann Brazo. I'm the CEO and founder of MPN Advocacy and Education International. With me today are um, two favorite pals of ours, um, Dr. Nicole Cousine and Dr. Linda Rizar. Um, they are uh, MPN pediatric specialists. And our topic today, of course, is going to um, be about uh, younger people with MPNs, um, very young and young adults. And um, we always love these programs, the conversations with the specialists, because it's just more relaxed and your questions are, are very welcome. Uh, we'll hear from Dr. Kusin, uh, who will just give us a brief update of what's going on in her world at uh, Wild Cornell. And then from Dr. Linda Rizar, who is at Johns Hopkins. And, um, and of course, we'll probably touch on um, COVID and uh, what's happening with younger people, you know, in schools now that have MPNs and, you know, just a plethora of, of different things, different, different areas that we can talk about today. And also you'll hear from our industry partners. We've got great news going on in clinical trials and new drugs being approved. It's just phenomenal. Um, you can post your questions in the chat at the bottom of your screens. And um, we thank you all for joining us today. And I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Kusin and we'll move right along. And hi, Cam, I see you in there. Thank you. Hello. How are you? Hi, Cam. Hi. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, sadly, we can't see all your faces, but we know you're there. Um, and hopefully we can interact through the chat and, and be able to to answer questions and talk later. Um, so as Anne said, I'm a pediatric hematologist oncologist. I work at uh, Wild Cornell in New York City, and I have a special interest in children with MPNs. So that is one of my main um, areas of clinical and research focus. Um, so some of you out there may be involved in my research study currently where we're trying to look at a number of different things, including genetics, um, proteins like cytokines. We're also trying to look at quality of life and how having these rare diseases impact children and families. Um, so some of the things we're working on, we're putting together a publication right now looking at thrombosis or blood clots in our young patients, because this is something that we know in adults is very important in MPNs. And, and in general, children get less blood clots than adults, but we do know that MPNs increase your risk of that. So we're putting together our cohort of patients and looking at the features that were associated with blood clots. Um, we presented some of that data last year at an international hematology meeting, and we're hopefully gonna get that submitted soon for publication for everyone to read and learn about, which I think will be great for our pediatric hematology colleagues. Um, we're working right now on analyzing some genetic sequencing. I think we know that in young patients, there are more patients who don't have a driver mutation. So in adults, a lot of patients have a JAK2, a CalR, an MPL. Not as many children have those mutations. And mm -hmm. we also don't know as much about secondary mutations. There's a lot of interesting literature that came out looking at genetic models where they can predict that mutations are acquired much earlier than when disease develops. So we're trying to look in some of our pediatric patients and really compare them to a group of young adults and a group of older adults and see what's the difference in the mutational profiles. Are there differences in the variant allele frequencies? How much mutant protein there is that might give us information on when these mutations develop and what they mean for our patients. So we're really excited about doing that analysis right now and that's great. Um, Dr. Reeser and I did some work together with some other colleagues looking at interferon in young patients. Um, it's an older drug that we actually are really excited about still using. And so that's stuff that we're continuing to look at in young patients. And one of the things I've been starting to do is interviews with families and young patients. And so if there's anyone on this Zoom who would be interested, please do reach out to me after, even if you're not currently part of my research study, we can consent you just for this part, because I think we really want to get a better understanding of of the impact of having a rare disease, both on a young patient um, and on their parents and sort of on the family unit together. And Cam, this is something I haven't, I forgot to tell you and your mom, so I want you guys to do this too. Um, but I think, you know, there are times where we recognize in medicine that there are impacts on families and there are things that are important to patients and families 
that are not always the things that physicians recognize as the most important. You know, we may say, oh, everyone wants a cure or a treatment or to feel well, but there are a lot of nuances to that and things that maybe are different. So I think getting a real understanding from the families and the patients themselves about what these diseases mean to them and what the diagnosis means is really important. So we've done an, a handful of interviews with um, pediatric patients and families so far, and I'm looking to complete some more of those. So I've been reaching out to some folks who I already know. And like I said, if there are folks out there with children with MPNs and you'd all like to be involved, there's a way to make that happen. Thank you, Nicole. And I'm glad to know this because, you know, we, we have been down this road before where we just haven't had enough information from, from not only the, the younger patient, but the family members. I mean, we have a handful, but today we have a lot joining us. A lot of people are joining us today. So, um, and we can send something out as well to make sure that we capture um, those folks that, that were not here today that might be interested in that project. Um, but sounds great. Everything you mentioned sounds great. Dr. Rizar, um, would you please, um, let us know what's happening at Johns Hopkins and how things are going with you. I know there's a lot happening. I would be delighted. So um, just like uh, Dr. Cousine, I'm also a pediatric hematologist oncologist and my research um, and clinical focus is on myeloproliferative neoplasias. Um, I'm excited to see young patients um, and there are lots of great opportunities for our younger patients. As um, Dr. Cousine pointed out, some of the more recent genomic studies are indicating that the, the driver mutations are occurring very early. In fact, there's even evidence that some of them may occur in utero. And so I think we're going to be recognizing myeloproliferative neoplasias more in our young patients. And I think it's going to be a, a more important problem because our technology is allowing us to diagnose it earlier. Um, and so, you know, as, as Dr. Cassine mentioned, we had the opportunity to collaborate on patients with interferon. Um, and the great news is they, by and large, did really well. Um, I know Anne's very excited about this, and many of our patients know there's a new, longer acting interferon, which is incredibly exciting because, you know, for instance, um, younger patients in particular, some of my patients are in college, to have to come in once a week for a treatment, who would not trade that for once a month? And I have my first patient who is a college student recently started it and is doing beautifully. So we're really excited about that. Um, also, as Dr. Cassine mentioned, thrombosis can be problematic in our younger patients. And so that's a really important area to investigate. Um, you can see I'm in a, my office in my laboratory and we study basic mechanisms in myeloproliferative neoplasia. So what happens to our blood stem cells when we get these MPN mutations? And we had a we have a recent paper that made the cover of blood and it's going to be coming out soon. It uh, identified a new uh, factor that's very important in driving progression. Um, and it also identified a number of different pathways that are upregulated when our blood stem cells acquire these mutations. And so what's exciting about that is what we would like to do is intervene. We would like to um, prevent MPNs from progressing. And we actually have mouse models. We have little mice that get PV and mice that get myelofibrosis. And we found that in just cutting down half of the dose of this gene, it completely prevents that progression. So we're really excited about that discovery. And we've actually started to collaborate um, with some colleagues in New York to develop a special protein degrader. It's called a ProTac. And the idea with this compound is to destroy the bad protein. And so we've already got some exciting preliminary data that we can, in fact, bind our protein and we'll be testing it in MPN cells to see if it can be destroyed. Um, so I think there are a lot of exciting discoveries on the horizon that will be particularly relevant to our new patients. And I, I was so thrilled to, to meet um, Dr. Cousine, I think through Anne years ago, because I think we're about the only two pediatric hematologists in the country and probably much of the world who really focus on MPN in young patients. So it's wonderful to be here and to get together. Yes, you are. And, and you know, which brings me to this next point. We, Mallory just informed me that we have so many people with us today from other countries. And wow. so, you know, what do we, how do we share? I mean, we can share as much information with them as possible, 
But what happens when you're in another country and you may not have a pediatric MPN specialist? You know, we, we've been through this before in this country where parents have wanted to take their, their younger child to a MPN specialist before, I think before we ever even connected. And mm -hmm. so this was years ago and, um, and they weren't allowed to because of insurance purposes, but because those physicians were not pediatricians. And um, it was very frustrating. And I know a couple of the parents have worked hard to change that. But um, yes, you two are the leading people in this field. And I'm, I'm so thrilled about what you're sharing with us today. I mean, already, it's just been amazing. Um, and so I'm going to uh, jump right into this question. But first, I wanted to let everyone know that the, gentle, the young man that was on earlier who will be joining us in, in a little while is Cam. Is a young uh, adult with, with an MPN. I think he's a senior in high school. Are you a senior now or in college? <laughs> no, no, no. I, I graduated college. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. I have a good skincare routine. <laughs> <laughs> You're adorable. Um, but he'll be back on <laughs> shortly. And thanks, Cam. And we'll call you back in a sec. So, um, so some of the questions that I've already gotten are about Bess Remy and, um, you know, so is it general practice for, for the two of you to use interferon? Is that kind of, you know, are you um, um, finding that interferon works better for your patients versus especially your younger patients? And what kind of process do you have to go through in terms of getting insurance to cover that for these children and, and so on. Can, can you both speak to that? Since you had this um, situation, um, Dr. Rizar, would you mind going first? Yeah, so, um, you know, we tend to prefer interferon therapy for our younger patients. Um, and the reason is there's very exciting data to suggest that interferon causes our hematopoietic stem cells carrying whatever mutation it may be that's causing the MPN, but the most studied mutation in this setting is Jack. But there's evidence that this can exhaust these stem cells and decrease the allele burden and get rid of them. And so, especially for our young patients, our goals are different. Like as Anne knows, my mom also has MPN, even she certainly doesn't qualify as a young patient, even though she's very young at heart. But our goals for her are different than our goals, for example, my 20 year old patients who are going to college and just starting their lives. And so ideally as pediatricians, we would like to cure their disease and get rid of their mutant clones. And so for that reason, I really Really prefer to go to interferons. Um, you know, some of the other medications like hydroxyurea certainly can improve symptoms and decrease counts, but they will not affect the clone. And there's always a risk that there can be some introduction of mutations because it's a kind of drug that affects how cells grow and divide. You know, ruxolitinib too is very uh, nice therapy for decreasing symptoms. And we have used that in actually one of my young patients who had to get a liver transplant because of a thrombosis, which um, Dr. Kusin was talking about. And he could not tolerate the interferon because his liver enzymes were going up, but we're thinking about reintroducing it. Now this longer acting um, agent is very exciting. The problem is right now it's only approved for use in adults. So my young patient who actually is on it is a college student. So not considered under eight, is not under eight. Right. So not considering a child. I know I've set up some calls with Besrami to figure out what we could do potentially to get younger patients on. So I'm not sure about that pathway yet, but hopefully as we learn more and, you know, with 20 year olds and 19 year olds on the therapy, I don't think they're that different than a 15 or 16 year old that should be um, informative. And, you know, if we can treat younger patients, um, you know, much younger patients, elementary school age with standard interferon, it strikes me that this agent will be fine and not have any untoward side effects. In fact, I can't imagine a little, littler child who wouldn't prefer one shot as opposed to, you know, one shot every four or six weeks as opposed to one every week. So I think it's exciting. And unfortunately, we probably have to wait some time before we can use it consistently in our very young patients. Um, Nicole, would you like to um, add anything to that or what your experience has been? 
Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with, with Dr. Rezer in that, you know, this is sort of the nature of most things in medicine that things get approved for adults and then there is a lag time before we can really use them in, in young, young patients. Um, so, so I think, as she said, using them in sort of older teenagers when they're available is great. And I think that that is sort of the first step in being able to, to work down and try to get them to younger kids because we can get in interferon, um, you know, we can get pegylated interferon approved in kids of any age. I think the youngest I've ever gotten it started on as a three-year-old. So, so I think because there's so much experience with interferon in the, in the medical community now that getting that for children is doable. It sometimes, and takes like a little finagling with insurance companies and writing some strongly worded letters. But other than that, it's usually not an issue. And so I think, you know, I think as we get more experience using you know, the really long acting products and in, in older teenagers, I think that will be something that we can then try to, to lower the age of and to get for our younger patients. Cause it's exactly right. Like if you could have a shot once a week versus once a month, you're going to take once a month. Like everybody wants that. So. So let me ask you this. I mean, given that both of you have patients on interferon and on other um, drug treatments, have you seen a difference? I mean, I, I know, um, uh, molecularly, um, there is a difference with interferon. Um, and is, do you see that with other drug treatments? And what are the differences you see in the in the um, in your patient co in those cohort of patients that are um, maybe remarkable? Maybe that's too big of a word, or you know, too intense. But that you see a major difference. Um, Linda, do you want to start? Sure. Um, so. The one of the features of interferon therapy is that it's it's slow, and in fact, um, our European colleagues who have been studying this in older patients for a very long period of time typically do not see significant decreases in the allele burden until two years. So one has to be patient. And in fact, when this therapy started, sometimes the, um, the mutated stem cell will increase. And I think that's part of the process of getting it to cycle and hopefully exhausting it and pooping it out and getting, getting rid of it. Um, so it is a, a slow process. And so many of our patients, when we start, and this has been true of um, my younger patients, most of them, when they start interferon, they still need phlebotomy or they still may, may need another therapy. So it's slower acting, but very effective. Now, the patient that um, I mentioned who's doing great on the ROPEG, um, that was just recently started. And remarkably, his counts and his um, liver tests, everything is better on the longer acting um, interferon. And it's a little hard to know because he had been treated with you know, standard interferon for about two years. So this is about the time we would be expecting, you know, his disease to be improving and the mutated stem cells to be um, exhausting and going away. But I've been delighted and thrilled to see that um, his counts are better than ever. And he used to occasionally have some trouble with liver enzymes going up a tiny bit, never anything that was dangerous, but it hasn't happened on the newer, longer acting agent. And I think probably biologically to get a little bit of dose all the time is better to get than getting bursts of dose you know it's it's probably more effective at least you know in this very limited experience that that's what it looks like the other patient i mentioned who had been on interferon but had a liver transplant um, he was switched over to ruxolitinib which is a jack inhibitor and we know when we have mpns typically our jack is cranked up it makes our blood cells in our stem cells make too much blood. And he did beautifully on both therapies. Um, you know, the only, the only caveat is with interferon, we have seen the mutation go down. And so that would be preferable. And that's why I mentioned we're going to restart it in him and see if he can tolerate it. And, you know, maybe the longer acting will be better. Um, Nicole, have you seen a vast difference in um, patients on interferon versus those on other um, oral drugs? I, I think there are some kids who do well with one drug and not another. And I think that is probably not unique to MPNs. Um, and, and I agree with 
with what Linda said about the time. Like I always tell families, like if we're starting interferon, I don't expect your counts to be normal in a month. You know, it's going to take time. And so we have to give it a number of months to really see some effects before we say we want to do anything differently. So, so right. So there are definitely times where if you need to get counts down quickly, like you've had a massive blood clot in the liver or something, interferon, you can start it up front, but you may need something else like hydroxyurea with it initially for a short period of time, or you may need phlebotomy for a period of time before you can back off of those things. But I, I think everyone's a little different. And, and there are really some kids who, who take hydroxyurea and do beautifully on it. Their symptoms are managed, their counts are managed, they feel well. We know it's not having an impact on their disease in the long term as far as any kind of you know, remission, but it is accomplishing what they need it to accomplish. And there are kids who take interferon and it's amazing and they're on it for years and they feel great. And we know it has you know, good disease benefits as well. So I think there's you know, a lot more potential to that in some ways, but I, I think you know, every kid's a little different. So I, I usually discuss different drugs with people and I, I will often recommend interferon, but if, if it doesn't work for a particular patient and they need hydroxyurea or they need roxalitinib, that's okay. Um, you know, I think you have to taper the management a little bit to, to the individual person that you're dealing with, which is the nice thing about having a couple of different options to work with, is that there's not just one thing you can do, you can do a few different things. Oh, I, and I, there's I, one- Yes, go ahead. I was just gonna say, um, uh, Nicole jogged my memory too, and, and, and because she made the excellent point that it doesn't work for everyone. And so for instance, like it was designed for Jack mutated, MPN. And with a Jack mutation, you can follow the allele burden. You can see exactly what's going on. There's some evidence that patients who have CalRET may respond less well. And then, of course, with our young patients, as, as Dr. Kusin pointed out, many are, do not have an identifiable driver lesions. And so in those patients, it's a bit tricky to treat with interferon because it's all we have to follow are the counts. We don't actually have an allele burden. So you know, it, it definitely is not for every patient, but you know, it's certainly an exciting therapy. And that was very interesting. I made a note here about that, um, Nicole. So, so they do not have a mutation. There's nothing evident except the counts. And does that come later? I mean, if have you had a cohort of patients that you watched age over time, you know, to maybe their twenties or, or, or thirties. And then suddenly you're starting to see gene mutations. I'm, if you can just explain that. I, I mean, I, I, so that's, it's an interesting question. And I think there are, you know, so there are certainly people who may have, you know, a driver mutation in a very low variant allele frequency that maybe gets missed on a test that you could pick up later. But we know that, that certainly in adults, at least like you, you acquire mutations over time, the longer you have these diseases and that's part of disease transformation and other things. So I think, I think the answer is yes, that there are probably acquisition of mutations in young patients that will happen. I think in order to do that, and I'd like to be able to do this, you really need serial samples from people at different time points so that you can follow them over time. You know, even if you can get, you know, a sample today and then a sample in five years, just comparing those would be really interesting. Doing that type of research is challenging. And because you need places to store the samples, you need you know, funding sort of longitudinally to allow you to do those studies. You need you know, continuation of, of researchers to continue working on those things. So I think that you know, those are really interesting questions. And again, some of the stuff that Linda and I talked about before, was really done with modeling. It wasn't necessarily done with like actual like serial patient samples. And I think that is sort of the next step is to really try to answer some of those questions with serial samples over time, which is hard to do. And I think will re require pediatric and adult hematologists to work together, right? Because Linda can see adult patients, but I, I don't. So like, I can't see someone when they're 35. So, you know, making sure that we can have sort of collaborative work with our adult colleagues, I think is really important to answer questions like that. I, I absolutely agree. I mean, that this is so interesting and so fascinating. Um, so if, if one goes from peg, pegylated interferon to ROPEG, does the clock reset on getting benefits or does it just continue since they are both interferons? Linda? It, it should just continue. And, you know, the, the reason being is their stem cells have already been exposed to the treatment. Um, and 
instead of giving it once a week when we give the longer acting form, they're still getting it and probably more continuously because it's a slower release. So we haven't seen any evidence that there's any, you know, um, detrimental effect to switching over. Okay. Um, Nicole, any the same? Right. No, I, I wouldn't expect you to sort of have to reset because yeah. you know, it's still the same class of medication in theory. Um, this question is, I started Best Remy in January and was curious when I should start seeing my blood work improve. Um, so that would depend on whether there was any preceding therapy um, and also um, if there's any concurrent additional therapy. I guess based on, and so I'm assuming the person who is asking the question is younger, um, but at least we can, if we extrapolate from the adult data, and most of this comes from, much of this comes from France, where, you know, they really started and pioneered the, the therapy of interferon. And in adult patients, typically what's seen is early on, there's actually an increase in the allele burden, which might sound a little bit scary, but I think what that means is the mutated stem cells are cycling and then they're going to diminish. Um, and so for those patients, it's usually about two years. And so if somebody just is being treated with the ROPEG and has never seen another therapy, I would predict it would be similar, but it may even be sooner because I, at least the theoretically, it may be better to have low levels constantly than to get these little bursts, which is what happened with the once a week injections or once every two week injections. Right. Okay. Do you have anything to add to that, Nicole? No, okay. that's great. All right. And so um, one of the questions was, how do we know? And I mean, this is a question we get from our older adults as well with MPNs. First of all, we know it's extremely heterogeneous. Uh, everybody is different. Everybody responds differently. There are many, many patients that don't take anything for years and years and are fine. Um, but how do we know any long-term effects on children? I'm assuming both of you have already begun looking at you know, the patients you have and are keeping track of what's happening with them. And, and um, you know, we've heard stories, wonderful stories about um, people that were much younger when they were diagnosed that when it actually went into remission and, um, and some came back, some didn't. And we also have, you know, seen some uh, quite a significant um, rise in transplants and successful transplants. And um, I realize that is not available to children, but to young adults, 21 and older, I'm assuming that that, that is. Are you seeing, you know, have you seen a significant change and rise in your practices with younger people, 21 and older, um, seeking out, you know, transplants or at, you know, being wanting to know more about transplants? I mean, so so I would I would say, Anne, kids actually do get transplanted sometimes. Right? Oh, they do. Okay, they I did do. not know so, that. So it's certainly not something we rush to in most patients, but but in in young patients, if if there's evidence of disease progression, sometimes transplant is a really appealing option if you have a good donor. So I know of a handful of of children and, and teenagers who have undergone mm -hmm. transplants for MPNs because of disease progression, and they've done really well, thankfully. Um, which is great. Um, and again, you know, a bone marrow transplant is not like, you know, a cup of coffee and a sneeze. Like there's a lot to it. It's very right. intense. Right. It has a lot of associated risks, but there are, for some families, if, if the, you know, if, if you're dealing with the risk of transplant versus the risk of ongoing disease progression and potentially leukemia in a very young patient, sometimes that risk benefit profile is in favor of transplant. So families have gone for it. Um, and again, I think if that's what the family wants to do, it's the right answer for that family. And, and again, a transplanter would not, I think, offer a transplant to someone who doesn't have a good match and who isn't necessarily a good candidate. Right. Um, but a lot of transplanters say, you know, the younger and healthier you are, the better it is to do a transplant. So, so it is not something that I think is the right answer for most pediatric patients, but it is sometimes the right answer for some. And, and I think it's certainly if something that a family would be interested in down the line, I have no problem like referring them to a transplant doctor, um, you know, just to hear about the risks and benefits and get the HLA typing started just to know what your options are in the future. 
First of all, I'm shocked because I honestly, after all these years, did not know that that MPN um, that children with MPNs were being transplanted. I had no idea. Not um, not all the time, but, but yeah, in all cases. And yeah. so this is something you know we need to be aware of and and know that it it does exist. And and I'm sure just like with adults, it's a very very um, very big decision and one that includes a lot of um, um, you know. Um, um, due diligence and, and bringing everybody together to discuss it and, you know, finding the right match and so on. But Linda, did you want to add something to that? Yeah. So, um, you know, just as um, Dr. Christine mentioned, of course, it's not, fortunately, most young patients don't need it, but both she and I certainly have had patients who older teenagers with advanced myelofibrosis. And, um, and, and that's part of the beauty of your organization. And um, Nicole and I have joined hands and we're collecting um, samples from some of these patients. I know she knows about a recent 19 year old young woman who actually was just transplanted. She had very advanced myelofibrosis, you know, her bone marrow was not making blood. And so in that sort of patient, it, the decision is, is a little bit easier because you know she really needs something. And I am thrilled to say that she did beautifully. Um, I believe her transplant was in fall when I first met her and we have samples that we're going to be looking at, you know, the things that um, Dr. Christine mentioned. And so in some cases, it is the best um, intervention and, um, you know, patients can do extraordinarily well when they have a good match. The other sort of exciting technology in transplant is there's an increasing um, success and progress with haploidentical donors, which means that just half of your genes need to be matched. And so that means everybody, um, every every person who has it is much more likely to have a donor. And so that's more of a future technology that's being done for MDS, for instance. Um, and so I'm expecting that will be another avenue for myelofibrosis, which um, could be a very good option for both young and old patients because the preparative regimens are much milder when you undergo a haploidentical transplant. Right. right. Um, this is so interesting. Um, would you encourage genomic testing for children of MPM parents in the absence of abnormal blood values? I, I would not personally. Um, I, while we know that there are some families who have MPNs, I, I think that going down that rabbit hole and potentially finding a an MPN associated mutation in a child who's otherwise completely healthy would probably cause more harm than benefit. I, I think, you know, being aware that it's in your family. And so certainly making sure your child has like normal routine blood work, but I don't, I, I think if you have a parent with a JAK2 mutation, for example, I don't think I would pursue that. I wouldn't recommend pursuing that in a healthy child. Linda, do you agree? Well, you know, it's a bit of a double-edged sword. So, you know, as, as Dr. Christine pointed out, if you have a parent with um, an MPN and the child's counts are perfectly normal, it's probably not necessary, at least with our therapeutic options currently, because let's say, let's. In, but on the other hand, you know, we have a quite a large cohort here at Hopkins where we've looked at familial incidents. It's about over 600 patients and 10 or 15% seem to have a familial incidence. And so, you know, I think as our therapies improve and as there's a chance for cure, we may need to revisit this. And so I'm sort of sitting in this situation with my mom who has MPN. And so I've checked my blood counts, um, you know, and if they were high, um, there was one time I was a bit dehydrated. I think I was working out a lot or something. I checked my Jack. Fortunately, it was zero. But so there will be instances when I think it will be the right thing to do, um, you know, and if we learn more about interferon in young patients and we learn that we can get rid of the mutant clone, that would be something we would want to do. I mean, one thing that's clear from family history studies, and there have been a large number, you know, in the Netherlands and in Europe, where with 23andMe, for instance, you know, most of us know you can get your, your um, genes analyzed for ancestry, but they, in that study, they picked up a number of people with Jack mutations and Many of those patients, not all, and I guess this becomes a, a little bit challenging, many of those patients will go on and develop an MPN. So it seems like knowing about something is probably useful in most cases. Um, 
I, I don't always agree, to be honest. Um, and but I think the situation of an abnormal blood count is a totally different one. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, because if you had a, a six-year-old who had normal blood counts and was perfectly healthy, mm -hmm. and you right. did a test for a Jack two mutation on them because their parent had one, and then it was positive. So you can't yeah. make a diagnosis of an MPN based purely on like a Jack two mutation, right? right? Like we know that people have clonal hematopoiesis but don't have diseases. And as right. we from the data we talked about before, you might have a mutation in utero and then develop a disease when you're 45. So right. you know, just identifying that mutation doesn't mean you have a disease, but it does mean then you need a bone marrow. It does mean you need more frequent monitoring, which if that's something the family wants to do is great. But I, I don't, I don't know that there's clear benefit to that child to doing that test and knowing that information. So I don't, I don't encourage it. If, if anyone asks me, I think it's probably somewhat dependent on the family and, and what their goals are of knowing that information and what they want to do with that information. Yeah, I agree. I would have to say I'm, I'm with both of you on this one. <laughs> Just if you want my personal opinion. Well, there's I really no right answer, right? There have been some no things right in, in my family that, you know, were genetic. I mean, the high cholesterol is genetic, you know, um, but there were other things that, um, and by the way, last year, my platelets were off the chain and I called Dr. Messa and he said, oh my God, you know, let's wait a while and see if you have ET and actually, I just had an inflammation, you know, it was, mm -hmm. it was caused from inflammation that is now gone and I'm fine. But I, I do, I do see both sides of this, you know, that, um, I, I don't know if I would, you know, if I would take my child in and say, let's check, you know, let's just make sure, but there's also that fear. And there are several familial studies. In fact, the first one I ever read was Dr. Wadley's in, years ago, and, and now um, Angela Fleischman and Alison mm -hmm. Moliterno, I mean, others are doing more familial studies. And um, so I, I see both sides of this coin, frankly, and it's interesting. Yeah, and I, I just wanna make sure I wasn't unclear. I definitely agree with Dr. Kusi and like, right. if my comments are completely normal, it seems like it's going to be more anxiety provoking. But, you know, just looking to the future, if we learn that some of our therapies can cure the clone, and if we learn that smaller clones are easier to cure, it might be something that we would do right. more readily. Got it. Yeah. So this is a rather long question, but I'll see, and you might not be able to answer this, but um, I'm 34 and a survivor, survivor of pancreatic cancer at age 30. Oh. I'm so sorry. Um, I'm currently diagnosed with ET at a it was at age 32, started on hydroxyurea, then a negrolide. I'm triple negative and currently stopped treatment due to my doctor wanting to see what my blood work would look like since the treatments weren't giving the results he wanted. Could interferon be a better option for me? Platelets are 1.5 million and I just started iron transfusions. I mean, I guess the question I would ask is, is when you say your doctor wasn't seeing the results they wanted, I guess, what were the results they wanted? Yeah. Was there like a platelet count goal that they had in mind? Um, you know, I think one thing we know for sure is that iron deficiency can increase platelets. So certainly if someone is iron deficient, I think, you know, when you don't have polycythemia vera and you're not concerned about driving up red cell counts, I think treating iron deficiency in a young woman is hundred percent an appropriate thing to do, whether or not you have an MBS. Right. Um, and, and it's possible that if you're iron deficient and you normalize your iron, your platelets will be lower, but, but I, you know, and, and I, you know, I think any of those, the treatments that you mentioned are, have the potential to, to benefit counts. I guess just the question is sort of what is the goal? And this is what I always talk about with parents is sort of what is your goal of treatment? Is it relief of symptoms? Is it alleviation of acquired von Willebrand's disease? There's not like a, a platelet count. We know that someone should be when they have ET um, or PV. So I, I guess that's my question for you to take back to your doctor, sort of what is the goal that they're looking for? And, and, you know, then maybe think about what, you know, why that wasn't met. And is that the right goal for you as an individual? Linda, would do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I, I agree fully. And in just as Dr. Christine pointed out, there are lots of reasons to have elevated platelets, as you now well know, and inflammation is the most common or iron deficiency in younger women. So, you know, really the goal is to figure that out and treat that. Um, and, um, you know, the I have used um, interferon in one triple negative patient, and that actually was a patient who really didn't tolerate it. She was on a very low dose and she seemed to feel sick and 
have flu-like symptoms. In contrast, our Jack Mutant PV patients, they actually feel better on it. So I think that's telling us something. And it, it's very tricky um, you know, to use that in somebody who's triple negative, because although you can follow the count, again, the count, we don't like Dr. Christine says, we don't have a magic count. But to know that we're having an effect is a little tougher. Um, so it seems like the iron um, infusions, if there's any evidence of iron deficiency, are a great way to go. Um, and it could be inflammation, just like Anne was experiencing earlier this year, mm -hmm. which is very common, of course. Right. Yeah, I had no idea, but it freaked me out. Yeah. <laughs> I thought, well, especially based on what you knew, knew I'm sure I mean, your little red flag meter was going right, on. Right, right. Um, and I, I've met teenagers who are on interferon who are triple negative and, and some of them do have, you know, count control with it. And if, again, if that's the goal, if the counts are doing something and you lower the counts and that something goes away or you feel better in some way, then sure, it's a good option. I think it really, again, just depends on what the goal of the, the treatment is. Um, Okay, um, good answers. Um, and I, I, I'm sure that these are, um, you know, when, when you're dealing with, and we go through this very often at our other programs and you two have been involved in some of those, when you're not the attending physician, it's a little difficult to answer those questions without all the facts, but we do the best we can. So at this juncture, I would like to introduce Cam again, bring him back and you are all welcome to stay. The physicians can stay here. Hi, Cam. Thanks so much for doing this, sweetheart. I really appreciate yeah, sure. it. But, you know, we always like to hear from young people and hear about their experiences with, with their MPNs. So I'm just going to hand it over to you if you'd like to share when you were diagnosed, what's happening, what treatments you're on, and, and go for it. Yeah, sure. So I am 22 now. Uh, I was diagnosed when I was 17, uh, actually two weeks before going to college. So it was a little, little crazy. Wow. So I wasn't expecting it, but I was Jack two positive, uh, and I got my bone marrow biopsy, and I was diagnosed with ET initially. Um, and throughout college, I was getting monitored and everything. I, I was getting phlebotomies pretty frequently, about every month at the time to two months. Um, and then I, I see Dr. Mascarenas in Mount Sinai, and it turns out I'm more towards the PV. So I actually have PV now. So I am more focused towards treating polycythemia vera. So, I mean, for me, these, these symptoms are pretty common, you know, fatigue, headaches, I have floaters, I guess I have pretty bad itching, which is the, ironically, one of the most annoying ones, <laughs> sometimes night sweats, but, you know, I just monitor everything, keep track of everything. And right now is the most interesting part of this journey, I guess, because uh, right now we're discussing treatment options now, because my symptoms are getting kind of a little bit worse. I'm more fatigued. Um, it's definitely a little bit more burdensome. And we're looking at interferon, actually. So it was nice to hear a lot about it, because uh, I was very curious myself what to do in terms of what options to take. So that was good to hear. But yeah. Yeah. And my okay. spleen is enlarged, actually. It's 18.4 centimeters. So that was something that uh, we recently found out, which I know is like, you know, pretty big comparatively to what it was. I usually had like a 13 centimeter or something. So, so um, when we talked last in our round table, um, you know, you have such a positive attitude about everything and, you know, you're, you're dearly loved. Um, that you are. And um, so, and, and so what would you say are your biggest hurdles? And, and, and obviously you're having symptoms. That's, that's an obvious, and especially after sharing this. Um, and so someone's asking right now, is there any way to get your contact information for their son who is 17? He was diagnosed. Oh, absolutely. With yeah. So my, okay, I mean, great. I could, I could type my phone number in. I yeah. don't mind. I don't or mind it. Maybe an detection. email address or something, you know, but yeah. Cam, would you say, would you say that, um, you know, you can get through a day? I mean, how are your studies going? You're in college and that's very stressful. Yeah. And so, yeah. So I graduated college in May. Oh, I'm uh, sorry. I no, no worries. <laughs> I'm working. So it's honestly, face I keep missing. Yeah. So I'm working now for, you know, right out of college, I started working remotely. 
So that's an interesting transition because I'm so fatigued and I'm blessed to be able to work remotely because to be honest with you, I feel like it would be very difficult for me to have a standard 7 a.m. commute, something like that. Yeah. So my hardest, my most difficult hurdle is combating fatigue, regardless of, you know, sometimes I'll get like 10 hours of sleep, but I'll still be exhausted. I think trying to balance exercise is something that helps a lot that I learned. So during COVID was when I was at my worst in terms of feet and symptoms. And that's because obviously everyone had anxiety, you know, stress. So that I think played a, a huge role in it, but also because I was sedentary. And I think if you don't actively try and fight or be proactive about your health, it will, you know, make your situation much worse. Like you said, I like having a positive mindset about it. And I think that really helps how I feel. Uh, but also in terms of like combating it itself, just be honest with your doctors about all your symptoms. And then also just exercise is huge for sure. And I think trying to get like a more uh, precise schedule of sleep, because in college it's very infrequent and it's really hard to balance as a student. So that definitely affected me drastically. Mm -hmm. But now that I have like a work schedule, I mean, my symptoms are getting worse, but it's like this, it's like the same level of fatigue. It doesn't fluctuate. So. So we, um, let's talk about your time during the lockdown and during COVID. Um, mm -hmm. You know, do you, when you came, when, we, you know, we're still in a pandemic, we're still living yeah. in a pandemic, but would you say, you know, socialization has been um, extremely important to you? I mean, is, have you, do you, do you talk to friends? Do you see friends? Do you, I mean, just for general health, talk about other things besides, you know, I mean, the, the physical symptoms and the medical symptoms are obvious, but there are mm -hmm. some psychosocial symptoms that come, that go with this disease and or with this blood Absolutely. cancer. And, um, and, and then compound that with, you know, a, a pandemic that has strongly affected all of us, but young people in particular. Yeah, so that's, that's exactly, you asked me what my biggest hurdle was, or it, I guess even is now, and it's definitely balancing seeming like a normal person when you're not. So that's my biggest hurdle for sure is because even at work, since I'm remote, I don't, I, I work with a lot of younger people and no one would ever suspect that I have anything, you know, going on. So that's something hard to battle because, you know, just the other day, I, you know, I had a really bad headache and I didn't want to work, but I still went and acted like nothing was wrong. So I think that's the biggest hurdle is sometimes trying to be a little vulnerable with your boss or your professors or, your friends and just letting them know like, Hey, you know, sometimes I just don't feel good. And like, just because I look normal doesn't mean I feel normal. So that's, I think the biggest thing with, with COVID, especially yeah. that like heightened everything. Right. So like, social socialization was huge. Like seeing my friends, like, cause I lived in a house. So I was fortunate, even though we were locked down, I still was living with people. If I was living alone, it would have been brutal. So Devastating. Yeah. definitely, definitely opening up. That's why I'm glad to open up contact information. It doesn't bother me. Yeah. You, you know, know there's, talking a, there's, is a book, there's a book that's called You Don't Look Sick. And we actually had the author at one of our events when we were meeting in person more frequently. And we're just starting to meet in person again with all the necessary precautions in place. But, um, you know, that's really tough when you have something that isn't visible. And, um, you know, like many people in this country have mental illness and it's, it isn't visible and people think, you know, come on, get it together. You're, there's nothing wrong with you. And, and we've had many patients that have been afraid to tell their employers that have been afraid to tell their coworkers or, or family members. And so, you know, I have to pat you on the back and commend you though for being such a smart young man and so with it. And um, one of the questions to you, Cam, is, um, did you have symptoms prior to your diagnosis? Were you a, a younger child or, or you said you were 17? I forgot. Yeah, I was. So I was 17 when I was diagnosed. So uh, interestingly enough, I actually had traces of high playlist counts when I was younger, but I didn't have any direct symptoms that I could think of other than floaters. I had floaters my whole life. That's one thing that I know I always had. I always like, as a kid was like, where are these stupid things? Like, you know, going across. But other than that, not not like fatigue or um itching it yeah i don't think anything worth noting that was like bad enough to tell a doctor right 
Now, I do know some of our patients that have that annoying itching situation. Um, I, doctors Kusin and Rizar, I mean, if you can, I know that some of the medications, the drugs out there for MPNs, some patients have said it has eliminated that itching or curtailed it quite a bit. Um, can either of you speak to that for Cam's sake at this point? You can stay with us, Cam. <laughs> Linda? Uh, yeah, so I guess um, in my experience and even in chatting with my mom, when counts are lower, symptoms very often are better. So, um, you know, for example, um, prior to phlebotomy, some of our patients with PV, if they're getting treated with phlebotomy, may have more symptoms. And after that, some of the itching could improve. Um, I think the patients who are doing well on interferon notice improvement in those symptoms. So, and even um, my patient, as I mentioned, um, who was originally on interferon and then on RUX also has improvement in symptoms on that therapy. So I think when the disease is being controlled, we can expect those itching symptoms to be better. Nicole, anything else to add to that? Yeah, no, I agree with that, right? Because these are inflammatory diseases. So when you're treating someone, you're in theory bringing down the counts, but you're also sort of trying to quell some of that inflammation. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you know, Dr. Moscarinus, he's the best. So, you know, I think if you're talking with him about interferon, I think that's a really reasonable idea for you. And I, I think, you know, that, that again, if you, if you sort of hush down the disease, that should help hopefully hush down some of the symptoms. So Cam, um, getting back to, you know, what, what would you impart to the young people that are on this webinar right now that, um, you know, just some thoughts of your own, you know, like what would you tell them if somebody, you're, you will be contacted, I'm sure. And, and, you know, what are some of the things you would share with them to help them navigate through this? Yeah, so. Diagnosis? Yeah. So for me, I think I always like when I first found out and I remember walking out and my mom was freaking, I mean, she's right here, but she, <laughs> yeah, she was I, freaking I thought out. She, was... <laughs> she thought it was the end of the world. And I realized for myself that that's not <laughs> the, the approach I wanted to take. So basically <laughs> I just try and live out. I think the, the number one thing you can do is just stay positive. Just know that, you know, you're in good hands. And, you know, like there's things like this that are so beneficial and resourceful for us. Um, you know, it's a really supportive community and group and the doctors are so kind and helpful. So that helps me a lot. Just knowing I'm in good hands, like I trust Moscarinus blindly, basically. <laughs> like, that's huge. But in terms of lifestyle, I realize that I can basically be normal. Like I get I have to impose my my month, you know, to get a phlebotomy or check my blood. But other than that, you know, these symptoms I'm hopeful that interferon will help me. And if you need that treatment, seek it, you know, consult with your doctors. And I, I'm looking forward to, you know, having better symptoms with the treatment coming up. So that's exciting. And I didn't need treatment for a while. I used, I was just on just getting phlebotomies and just getting a baby. I have baby aspirin daily. So yeah, I mean, positivity, being proactive, exercise is huge. And like you said, with the socialization, don't, be afraid like I have friends who know about it and they're very supportive and always checking in like how are you that's huge that's definitely something that you need like you need a support like my mom is definitely the best support because she, but she's also <laughs> crazy but it's okay <laughs> we've we've met your mom and I, I she's wonderful I love her and you know I mean think about it it's it's your child and and uh, my daughter just went through some cancer and that was scary and Believe me, I freaked out at home and away from her, but not in front of her, but she's fine now, thank God. And, and um, but you know, they're very, it's very particular when it's your mom and your child. And, um, but I'm so glad to hear that you're still seeing friends and still, you know, trying to get back out there and be in, and you are, have you been vaccinated and boosted? I'm mm -hmm. assuming. Good yeah. for you. Good for you. And it's so important, Cam, but um, God love you. And thank you so much. <laughs> for being here. Seriously, I just adore you. And um, <laughs> thank you. you know, and I hope that I hope that, you know, the whatever treatment is decided upon that it does help with your symptoms. And um, 
that um, we see you real soon in person, maybe in the near future. Yeah. Thank you so much. I appreciate welcome, it. Welcome, sweetie. You're welcome. No. And, and you'll be hearing from other patients, I'm sure. Um, and so I'm going to move on to some other questions here. And you might be involved, Cam, but I'll call you back if I, you know, okay. if you want to stay, you're welcome to. Um, any recommendations on an approach for a two-year-old? I think you answered this, um, Nicole or, or Linda. Yeah, um, I'd like to write in the Extreme chat. platelet levels and triple negative ET. The father has triple negative ET and he was diagnosed at age 12. Right. Mm -hmm. That, that again is a different story. Um, and, and so, so I will say, you know, so you mentioned Dan, right? Like when your platelets were high and how like panicked you got, you know, we know that inflammation and things like infection cause high platelets. That is not as common in adults. We see it like literally every day in kids. Like I can't tell you how many consults we get for kids with platelet counts, 800,000, a million, because they have the flu, they have RSV, they have something viral going on. It's so common. Little kid bone marrow is like super reactive. So, so while it's, it's not unusual to have a, an elevated platelet count in like a one or a two-year-old. And honestly, I think what's normal for a one and a two-year-old, we now really kind of think is different than what's normal in a 10-year-old. But, but if you know, you have a family history of someone who presented early with very high platelets, that might be a good you know, group to go see um, like a geneticist and really talk about like beyond the, you know, the traditional JAK2 CalR MPL mutations, are there like familial mutations to look at, like in the thrombopoietin gene or other, you know, JAK2 or MPL genes that run in families that may not, they may be an MPN or it may be like a familial type of thrombocytosis. So I think seeing a geneticist is great for something like that because they can do much more extensive genetic testing. Mm -hmm. Linda, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think that's great. And, and one, of the, one of the things that we're doing more of, but predominantly in adult patients, and I think as the sequencing costs go down, we may be able to do this more in younger patients, and that is sequencing their peripheral blood cells. And, and that's how we're learning that actually all of us, not just our MPN patients, are acquiring mutations in our blood stem cells with age. And so, um, you know, I think that that as we can do more of these studies, we may understand more people like this this family of the little two year old with an elevated platelet count. And and that you know kind of goes back to what we were talking about a, a little while ago. But um, so um, when we when all right, so this question is um, let's see which drugs we kind of talked about this. What drugs you typically um, prescribe for a young uh, MPM patient. Um, and we kind of all, and we also talked about the differences. Do you give the same dosage to children that you give to adults or to, you know, like how do you determine the dose of, you know, like hydroxyurea or ruxolitinib or, you know, Nicole, can you speak to them? For, so for interferon, I, I just start with 45 micrograms in anybody. And if it's a really little kid, what I've done is start mm -hmm. every other week just to make sure it's tolerated. But, but to give a dose much lower than that, I think is a little challenging. And so I've always just started with that dose, even in the really young patients. For hydroxyurea, so, so the majority of things we do in pediatrics are weight-based as opposed to flat dosing for adults. So like for hydroxyurea, I will start somewhere in the like 10 to 15 milligram per kilogram range and, and kind of adjust from there. But it's, it's usually not a fixed dose. Like with older teenagers and adults, it's really based on the size for some, a lot of the things we do. Linda? Totally agree. <laughs> okay. Okay. So um, we have a few more minutes here and I'm sure we'll get other questions as well, but um, what would you say, you know, we've got, we've got so many new drugs in the pipeline, several that are about to be approved or, or a couple anyway, a couple more that are about to be approved. And, um, you know, we, I, I think that we all get into habits and, and, you know, I've heard physicians say, well, I'm going to stay with this one because it works and I'm not going to try anything else and the patient's doing well. And, and, um, and so when do you cross the street to, or, you know, when do you make that decision to try a different treatment option? For me, at least, I, again, I guess it, I think it depends on sort of 
you know, what was the reason we started the treatment in the first place? So if somebody presented with like a splanchnic vein thrombosis and our goal is to really normalize their counts as much as possible, and we have them on something and it's not working, I, you know, again, I think interferon we know takes a lot longer. So I, I wouldn't in that setting probably start it alone. I would probably start it maybe with like a short course of hydroxyurea just to really get the counts down. Um, you know, but I think I have a like a specific goal of like normalizing counts in that setting. Whereas if it's something a little less defined, like someone who has acquired von Willebrand's disease and can't do a sport they want to do because of the bleeding risk, I might say, we're just going to, you know, we want to get to a platelet count where that goes away. So if we're not getting resolution of that, or if we started it because of a symptom that someone was having that wasn't previously well controlled and it was affecting their quality of life and their day-to-day -day existence, and the, the medication after, you know, depending on the drug, like a number of weeks or months is really not changing the quality of their life, then I would say that isn't working for the goal that we started it for. And now we can reassess. So I, I think it, to me, at least it depends on why you started the medicine. And if you know, it's like a quicker acting thing versus like an interferon, which we know does take more time. All right, Linda. Yeah, I think what um, Dr. Cousine has done a beautiful job is to say that as physicians, we try to personalize their therapy. So, you know, um, we try new things if that makes sense for that patient. We keep their existing medicines or something that's working well if that makes sense for that patient. And, you know, it's very much we want to give the best care for each individual patient and not everybody's the same, of course. Um, and so I, I agree completely with um, Dr. Kasim. So so we talked about this. I know the three of us have said this to each other or in, in a mm -hmm. um, situation like this before about, you know, um, drugs that new drugs that are in the pipeline or other drugs that are on the shelf that um, unless you've tried them, you don't know if the patient, you know, could be doing so much better or, you know what I mean? Um, and, and this was just, this comes up often in conversations, but, but it is interesting. You know, I think, I think I would feel more comfortable just, to, just personally, if I was on a medication that exists and I was doing well, I would probably not want to switch, you know? So, um, I mean, that's, that would just be me and, you know, a uh, uh, creature of habit in some ways, like all of us, but um, I mean, if I so, don't, don't fix it to some degree, right? Like if it's working for you and you feel good. Yes. Yeah. Clearly if something comes to... along that has, you know, additional benefits, you know, right. that may be even better for your goals. Like, yeah, right. That's, that's sure. Right. Um, the other thing, yes. And I was just going to say, I think Cam mentioned how, um, you know, nice the patients and doctors are and, you know, as, as Dr. Kasim pointed out, many of the treatments are first initiated in adult populations. And I have to say, I, I agree completely with Cam, the MPN community is absolutely wonderful and collaborative. And so, you know, when I'm doing a treatment that we haven't used in younger patients, I touch base with my colleagues who treat older patients. And, you know, it's, it's very helpful. And just like, I think some of the patients have mentioned they're in relatively remote places. Um, Dr. Christine and I do a lot of you know, consultations by the phone. Now we can even do Zoom in some cases, thanks to our pandemic. Yeah. Um, and so we're we're always willing to help and work with local doctors. And when we get stuck and haven't used something in our younger patients, we talk to our um, colleagues who treat older patients and may have used it. I totally applaud both of you. And I agree a thousand percent that this space is a unique space. It's unbelievably collegial. It is unbelievably um, accessible, and um, for patients, you know, I mean, it, it is just incredible to me. It's you know, after 17 years of this, it's just gotten better and better as far as I'm concerned. It's just been great. Um, so here's a question: My 15-year-old son has ET, he's CalR mutation type two, with no other mutations in NGS and platelets around 1,200 with no treatment not even aspirin. His hematologist said if his platelets reach 1500, then he will start interferon. Is that in your estimation, a good option? So, so a couple of things I would say about that. And, and one thing to sort of just like piggyback and to what you and Linda were saying, I, I think the nice thing about this field is that one, it's very collegial and that people are happy to talk to each other. And the thing that's maybe not the best for families, but is, is somewhat helpful for physicians that is that there's not always one right answer yeah, yeah. and that people may have different opinions about 
what they think is best based on their interpretation of the literature and their experience. And that's okay. You know, there are clearly things that are like defined in adults and that's one thing, but in kids, I think there's a little more flexibility, which allows you to work with families, you know, so, so there are some patients that I follow with, with Cal R mutated ET. And I will say that the kids with the Cal R mutations seem to run some of the highest platelet counts. I, I don't know exactly why that is, but, but that is what I have noticed. And, and there are some of them who are on no therapy and their platelet counts are, are over 1500 and they are not bleeding and they are not having any symptoms and they're doing their things that they want to do and they feel great. And I think that's fine. You know, there is, on the other hand, there's the concept of disease progression. And, and there are some people who would like to do whatever they can to try to minimize that risk. And so for them, they want to be on interferon if they can potentially have benefit from that. Um, and so I, I think, you know, I don't think there's a right platelet number. And so I guess my question to your son's hematologist would be, why is that the number he chose? Is there, you know, a paper he read or some experience he's had that's given him that number? I, I know a number of kids who have a platelet count over 1500 and they don't have any problems related to the platelet count. I guess there's the separate question of what is, you know, the disease risk. And if you're, you know, someone who would prefer not to be on medication, then you follow the disease closely and you make sure that, you know, you don't miss disease progression. But if you are someone who would prefer to minimize the risk of that, then medications are an option. And that's what interferon has potential benefit for. So I, I think, you know, in a setting where someone says, you know, this is my, my magic number, I guess I would just ask why, because I mean, I don't have a magic number and I don't yeah. think Linda has a magic number. So I'm just curious, like where that magic number comes from. And then again, <laughs> I think talking about what are your goals for therapy um, with something like interferon and talking about the different risks and benefits of it and deciding, you know, what is the benefit you want and, and are the risks minimal enough that you want to aim for that benefit. And, and that's sort of how I discuss medications with families. Linda? Yeah, agreed completely. I definitely don't have a magic number. And the other thing to keep in mind, which we've sort of discussed um, in a different context is platelet counts can, can go up and down even in our ET patients. So if there is some sort of inflammatory infection, um, the platelet count may kick up for a bit and then come right back down. So that's another thing to keep in mind. Um, I can vouch for that <laughs> without having an MPM. Um, and so just to wrap up your piece of this, and then we're gonna go um, talk to the uh, industry partners and hear any updates on clinical trials. Um, in your space, you know, Linda, you talked a little bit about the trials you're working on. Um, mm -hmm. Is there anything you'd like to share with our audience that, um, you know, do you need more people in a trial? Do you, you know, are you looking for certain cohorts of patients? Um, you know, anything that you'd like to share, you know, before um, we head into the industry partner updates? Well, I guess one thing I just want to do is applaud you and, and Nicole, um, you know, these kinds of programs help us get together, help us meet patients, help us learn about what are the most important symptoms and questions. Um, you know, we're doing together with Nicole, we've been collecting some samples to look at genomics. Um, we also would like to look at some cytokines. And so, and, and I think one of the patients mentioned that they were a bit they were in Maine and their doctor didn't have expertise, were available to help. And, and even Nicole and I, we talk to each other about our patients that are challenging to see if we agree because, you know, we want to do the best we can for you. So I think, you know, the future is very optimistic and I, I really appreciate the opportunity to get together with doctors. A lot of the MPN doctors I've met and now collaborate with, I met through you, Anne. So, oh. so these kinds of forums are wonderful. And yeah. um, I think the future is very bright and we're here to help. Yeah, thank yeah, you. I, I agree with Linda. I, I mean, again, I, I think this is stuff where at least on the physician side, we all have the same goal of learning as much as we can about these diseases so that we can help families and children. Um, and so, you know, we, we get contacted, like she said, by doctors all the time. And, and so if, if your doctor says to you, I don't know a lot about this, like, we're happy to talk to them, like have them call us, you know, that the same way that if there's something that we're not expert in and we have a colleague who is, we'll reach out to them. So, so we are happy to speak to doctors at other centers um, and talk about our experience and, and how we manage various situations. We do that all the time. And, and I would say, you know, so one of the things I'm working on trying to do is get um, a setup. So currently the research study that I have ongoing is to, to give samples 
someone either has to be seen at Cornell or at UCSF, which is the other place where I have it open, or has to be seen by Dr. Reeser, and we can collaborate together on a variety of different things. But I'm working on trying to get that set up so that it's not the case, so that if folks do want to participate in those types of research studies, they'll one day hopefully be able to send us samples. But for now, I would say if anybody um, has a child with an NPN or is a teenager um, with an NPN and, and the family would like to participate in the family interview study, that we can do remote consenting. It's all done on Zoom. So we can kind of just you know set it up with whatever your schedule is. If there's a you know a kid who's in college and the parent is at home and the, we can all be on a Zoom together. Um, so it's pretty easy to do. So I'm gonna put and do you think the easiest thing to do is just put my email in the chat? Yeah, you have a link. And if, yeah. if anybody's yeah. interested and in then, that study, they can just right. email me. And then um, if you want to send us a uh, paragraph, we can put that in our newsletter, which will be going out next week. Okay. And, um, and we can reach some other folks that way as well. Yeah. So um, Nicole will put her her link or email address and um, and then stay with us because we are going to uh, move into hearing from our industry partners. And by the way, we would not be able to do any of this without their help. Um, every group in the MPN space, you know, gets assistance and support from our um, industry partners. And we're grateful because we would not be able to do this without them. And of course our physicians, we love them. and. Um, Ladies, thank you. Stay with us if you'd like, and we will move on to our updates. Um, our first um, update is from Dr. Ray Urbanski, who is the head of clinical development and medical affairs at Pharmacentia. Ray, are you with me? We're a little early. I don't know if you're there yet. I'm here. Here you are. Hi there. Hi. So um, please tell us what's going on with Besremi. Okay, should I show a slide or you just want me to chat? You can show one slide. <laughs> um, okay, hold on. I just need to be enabled. Yeah, we're here we go. Mallory's hard at work. It, you should be okay now. Got it. So, you know, I, first of all, I have to thank your participants, Dr. Cousine and Ressar, because I thought the conversation was quite interesting, especially since... Um, I was part of the team that actually developed Ropeg interferon or Besremi. Um, as you know, we were approved in uh, November of 2021. So we've been on the market for about four months now. Um, I think as someone indicated, we are, we are indicated across all lines of therapy for adults and adults being defined as uh, greater than or equal to 18 years of age with uh, polycythemia vera. Um, but a little bit about our company. So Pharmacentia, our US headquarters is based in Boston. Um, we do stay connected with the NPN community through uh, organizations such as Anne's. Uh, I know Anne has thanked us, but I can't thank her enough for all the connections and, and information and dialogue that she's allowed us to have with not only healthcare providers and KOLs, but, but patients, et cetera. Um, our focus really is on the MPNs. Uh, we are doing a global study in essential thrombocythemia. Again, it's in adult patients. Um, and what I will suggest or ask uh, if Dr. Kusina and Dr. Resser would not mind if I contacted them uh, sometime after this call, uh, because we are certainly interested in studying um, Best Remy in, in patients younger than 18. Um, yeah. And again, what that study might look like, I would love their input. And actually, if they want to get involved, that would be welcome as well. Yeah, let's all um, talk. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, so so one of the one of the positive things about Best Remy, um, besides all of the things that 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 you two have spoken about earlier in the call, is the clinical studies we did in the adult population went on for for longer than seven years, and I, I think that that's certainly. Uh, important because as, as people were indicating, especially for younger adults, they're going to be on this treatment most likely for life. Um, the dosing can be um, as, as infrequent as, as once a month. Um, and so I, I think having data that far out to show the durability of the response over a prolonged period of time is very beneficial. And, and that sort of was one of the FDA's 
major reasons why they were very interested in Best Remy uh, was because we did have data that supported the durable response. Um, and for those of you who are not aware, there's these NCCN guidelines, and these are basically treatment algorithms that a lot of payers and a lot of healthcare providers and, and organizations actually follow. Um, and important to this conversation is we were recommended in both low and high risk, and we're the only sort of disease modifying disease specific uh, drug that actually is included in low risk patients. Again, very prevalent to this, very important, I should say, to this population, because the only thing in low risk uh, treatment right now is aspirin and phlebotomy. And so now we have another option for patients who are younger than 60 and haven't had a thromboembolic event. Um, we're now sort of indicated or recommended based on, on the guidelines. Um, so that's it with Best Remy. Uh, obviously, we have a website, and if patients who are on it, we do have patient support through our Pharma Essentia source, uh, and you can simply um, uh, search that on the internet, and you'll find out all the array of, of patient, uh, patient assistance programs that we have. So one last thing, and before I forget, I'd be remiss. Um, in recognition of all of this, the National Organization for Rare Disorders, or NORD, uh, awarded Pharma Center the 2022 Rare Impact Award. So it's just an, another sort of icing on the cake for the very successful year we had in 21 and 22. Congratulations. And I did see that. That was great. Um, and so thank you, Ray. And, and you know, to all of those who listen to this, these presentations, um, bravo to, you know, new drugs in the market for MPNs. I mean, it's been a long time coming. We've had a few and, and, and it's slowly starting to happen, but thank you, Ray, very much. Oh, thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Yes. And so moving along, we're gonna hear from Bina Patel, who's the medical science liaison at CTI Biopharma. Bina, are you with us? There you are. Hi, Bina. Hi, Anne. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, so I wanted to thank uh, the entire MPN advocacy and education team. Uh, my name is Bina, for those who don't know me, and I'm a medical science liaison at CTI Biopharma. Thank you, Anne and Mallory and the whole entire team for holding another successful clinical forum for patient education. Um, this discussion was really educational and informative for me personally, and I also want to thank you for the opportunity to provide an update about our work at CTI. As you have eloquently stated, it takes all three groups, patients, clinicians, and industry to work together to improve therapies and patient lives. We are excited to share that Percutinib, a JAK2 IRAC1 inhibitor, received accelerated accelerated approval by the Food and Drug Administration on the 28th of February for patients living with cytopenic myelofibrosis. The approval was based on efficacy results from the pivotal phase three persist two study in patients with low platelet counts, which compared percutinib at two doses to best available therapy that included rexolinib. As part of the accelerated approval, CTI is required to describe a clinical benefit in a confirmatory trial called Pacifica. Cytopenic myelofibrosis can be defined by having low platelet counts and anemia. Patients who have cytopenic myelofibrosis have limited treatment options. And our approval is in adult patients with myelofibrosis with platelet counts of less than 50,000 because we recognize that these patients often have more advanced disease and many cannot tolerate currently available treatment, uh, treatments at full doses. And in light of the recent approval, we are no longer enrolling US patients into our pivotal phase three Pacifica study of percutinib versus physician's choice therapy. Pacifica is still enrolling patients with MF and platelet counts less than 50,000 outside of the US. And this study considers patients who either have had no prior exposure to JAK inhibitors or who have had a limited prior exposure. Patients with up to six months exposure may be eligible. The study enrolls patients who have splenomegaly and symptoms related to myelofibrosis. Patients are randomized two to one to percretive versus physician's choice therapy, which can include ruxolitinib, danazole, hydroxyurea, and corticosteroids. And you can find more in information about this trial at pacifica-trial.com as well as clinicaltrials.gov. We do remain committed to completing the study as part of our FDA uh, approval process. And our team at CTI remains excited by a partnership with MPN Advocacy and Education International, and we continue to support rigorous science and data that will bring much needed therapies to patients living with myelofibrosis with the goal of improving symptoms, spleen response, and providing hematologic stability. Thank you for your time. Thank you and congratulations. And again, yay, more, more drugs available to our um, patients. That's great. 
Great news. Thank you, Bina. So now we'll hear from Nora Boyer, who's the Vice President of Medical Affairs at Protagonist. And hi, Nora, how are hi. you? Good. Hi, hi, Anne. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for inviting me to come to this um, wonderful uh, presentation. I too learned an awful lot. Um, I know time is growing short, so I do have one little slide. But before that, let me tell you about um, Protagonist. Protagonist is a, a biotech company located in the South Bay area of San Francisco. We're um, based a peptide-based technology, and our our lead drug, which you probably have heard of, is Resveratide or PTG300. Um, we've just, we're excited, we we finished um, enrollment in our, our phase two, very successful. And based on that, the FDA has given us approval to move forward with our phase three. And we just opened, uh, initiated that um, this quarter of this year. So we're very, very excited about that. And I, I'll share, uh, I can share with you my one slide that just, if you like, just tells us about the trial design. Unfortunately, at this point, it's not in pediatrics. I did check to see if our other phase two and the uh, we had we did have a few eighteen year olds in that, um, but I thought I would share it with you anyway, with hopes that maybe we will be moving into pediatrics soon. And if I can find that, sorry, Ann, can't find it. I'm trying to find the share. While you're, while you're looking for that, just know that, um, you know, again, this is pediatric and young adult. And so 18 to 35. So yeah, okay, there it is. There it is. Here's the study. So it's, it's respiratory. It's a phase three study design. We, oh. We've named it Verify. Um, and the criteria is for adults with PV, um, high and low risk. And we're allowing... Um, Patients have had to have had frequent phlebotomies, and they can also we call this our add-on study because they can they can just have had phlebotomies or they can have been on cytoreductive studies. Um, and the primary endpoint is absence of phlebotomy, phlebotomy eligibility based on hematica control between weeks 20 and 32. It's going to be a global study um, in about 250 sites. And the primary additional assessment will be durability or response out to 52 weeks. And then we'll continue with open label treatment. Um, key, the key secondary endpoints, of course, are the number of phlebotomies. And um, with our phase two, we did see symptom improvement. So we're going to confirm that and confirm the safety of the study. Um, it is on clinicaltrials.gov. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. Well, thank you very much. Okay. And if we, if we get some questions, I'll forward those to right. you. I don't see any at this time, but. Um, um, great information. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, we're excited about it. Thank you so much, Ann. Yeah, thanks, Nora. We'll, we'll see you. you soon. Thank you. Um, okay, we'll move on to Cartos Therapeutics and Andrea Blank, who is the Vice President of Medical Affairs. Hello, Andrea. Hello again. Hi, Anne. Hello, hello. Thanks, Ann, for your time today. Um, Dr. Rasser, Dr. Cousine, just wonderful um, information you were able to share today. So thank you for your time. And Cam, we also want to take a moment to just say thank you for sharing your story. Um, I'm an oncology nurse practitioner by training who has the joy of working here at Cartos. And anytime a patient can share a story, I think it's so impactful for those, both patients and caregivers to um, better understand and feel connected with the community. Um, so as Ann mentioned, I work at Cartos, which is a um, biotech company that's also located outside of San Francisco. We are currently studying a drug called KRT-232 or navtamadolin, which is an MDM2 inhibitor that allows for P53 to do its normal activity and ideally repair DNA or cause um, malignant cells to um, apoptose or die. And um, this really helps to then hopefully control the patient's myelofibrosis. And um, we have a variety of studies in a variety of settings. Um, I'll share a slide at the end that has our website um, where you can look at more of our studies, but certainly the one um, study that I'd love for you all to be aware of today is called Boreas. Boreas is a phase three trial in which we're looking at um, patients who've received a JAK inhibitor and after they've received their JAK inhibitor and have relapsed or have not received an ideal outcome with that JAK inhibitor are now being treated with KRT-232 or naphtamadolin. And um, it's a randomized study that looks at this drug versus um, what would be of 
excuse me, other alternative therapy at this line of therapy. And um, we're recruiting patients, not only in the US, but also outside the US. I know we have some um, ex-US participants today. Um, so I'm just going to share briefly with y'all one slide simply because at the bottom of it, you'll see not only our um, website for our company, but also the website itself for the trial. So you can see here, boreas trial.com and then cartosthera.com. So please don't hesitate to visit either of those sites. There also is an area on the Boreas um, trial website where you can input your information to receive um, further um, conversation and information about this trial. And it actually directs, directly links right to my email. So it's a way to um, send a nice direct email to me and we can have a conversation more about not only this trial, but perhaps the other trials that Cartos is offering depending on your disease and what treatments you may or may not have yet received. So that is everything over at Cartos. And again, to you and your team, thank you as always for everything that you do for the MPN community. We are very lucky to have you. Oh, thanks, Andrea. I really appreciate it. And Cartos has been a great partner. Thank you very yeah. much. So we will move on to Sierra Oncology and Lauren Musto, who's the Senior Director of Corporate Communications and Patient um, Advocacy. Hi, Lauren. Hello, Anne. Thank you. Nice to see you. It's good to see you too. Thank you so much for putting this program together today and inviting Sierra to participate. We're honored as always to be here. Um, really quick, you know, as Ann mentioned, my name is Lauren Musto. I oversee corporate communications and advocacy here at Sierra. And if you're not familiar with us, we are a late stage biopharmaceutical company. We're focused on delivering targeted therapies for rare cancers, including myelofibrosis. And we really pride ourselves on taking an evidence-based approach to this um, so we can investigate new ways to change the cancer treatment paradigm. And of course, we understand and realize we can't do this alone, which is why, again, we're so incredibly grateful to the cancer community at large, including our physician partners, but also really the advocacy community and all the work you're doing, and because really it's only together that we can transform the promise of a pipeline candidate into actual outcomes for our patients. So right now, our main focus is on the development and commercialization of mamalotinib, which is an investigational agent for the treatment of myelofibrosis. Mamalotinib works by inhibiting three key signaling pathways that contribute to the major manifestations of disease. So by inhibiting ACVR1, as well as JAK1 and JAK2, we believe that mamalotinib has the potential to improve anemia of myelofibrosis while also improving constitutional symptoms and splenomegaly without impacting platelet counts. And we were thrilled to announce positive top line results from our phase three momentum study of mamalotinib in January of this year. Based on those results, we're on track to submit a new drug application in the second quarter of this year. And assuming all goes according to a plan and we do get an FDA approval, we would anticipate uh, availability of the product early in 2023. Also excitingly, last August, we announced that we had in-licensed a novel BRD4 BET inhibitor to expand our pipeline. So that's called SRA515, which was previously known as AZD5153. And it's really differentiated through its high potency, selectivity, and bivalent binding, which may offer more complete target inhibition relative to other monovalent binders. Now, because mamalotinib is not myelosuppressive, we believe the combination of mamalotinib and SRA515 may provide improved efficacy and safety over other JAK inhibitor, BET inhibitor combinations. Our plan right now was to initiate a phase two trial examining that combination in the first half of this year for the treatment of myelofibrosis. And we'll be excited to share some more details about that study as we get a little closer to trial initiation. So to close again, and we're so incredibly grateful to everything that you are doing on behalf of the MPN community. It's our absolute pleasure to work with you. Thank you to all our patients that participate in these trials and to our physicians that are on the call and help execute these studies. We couldn't do what we do without all of the collaboration here today. So thank you again. Well, thank you. And I've been following this drug along with the others, mm -hmm. but this one in particular for quite a long time. So lots of good news and we really appreciate it, Lauren. Thank you. And so, or Nora, I'm so sorry. I'm looking at these. 
Nora, thank you. Um, so we're moving along, <clears throat> excuse me, to Constellation and um, to um, Sean Li Yi, who is a field medical director for Constellation. And good to see you again. How are you? Very nice to see you again, Anne. It's always great to be here. And another fantastic webinar and very informative again. Um, so I know we are at the end of the hour. I'll try to be brief for those who I haven't met. My name is Shang Yi Liao, Field Medical Director at Constellation Medical Affairs. Briefly about Constellation, we are Massachusetts-based biotech companies with over 12 years of discovery and development history focused on epigenetics and cancer biology. Our drug candidates, which were all internally discovered are the products of our expertise in gene targeting for diseases, where gene regulation and control matters. As of July 15th last year, Constellation Pharmaceutical is now a morphosis company. Um, we are currently in transition right now, so you're gonna see us use the two names back and forth. However, what remains unchanged is our commitment to deliver a breakthrough therapy that brings hope to patients. The lead compounds generated at Constellation is an investigational BET inhibitor, Polarbacid, which also goes by the name of CPI 0610, that we are developing as a potential treatment of myelofibrosis. Polarbacid is a novel orally administered small molecule that is designed to selectively inhibit the function of BET protein to decrease the expression of the abnormally expressed genes in cancer. Please note that Polarbacid is an investigation agent and is not yet approved by any regulatory agencies. Constellation is currently conducting a phase two clinical trial of Polarbacid in myelofibrosis and ET, and a larger phase three trial, Manifest II study, has been initiated for myelofibrosis. Manifest II is a randomized double-blinded phase three trial in adult patients over 18 years old with myelofibrosis who have not been previously treated with a JAK inhibitor. The purpose of the study is to evaluate the efficacy and safety of Polarbacid plus Ruxo compared with Ruxo alone. For more information, you can find both Manifest and a Manifest 2 study at clinicaltrial.gov or check out our website at manifestclinicaltrials.com. At Constellation, our interest and commitment to patients and caregivers extends across the MPN community as we have additional plans for collaborative and early stage programs that may have utility in MF and other MPNs in the future. With that, final thank you, back to you, Anne. Oh, thanks very much. It's good to see you and hear from you and, and we'll talk soon. Um, thank you. And now from Jiran, uh, Dr. Faye Feller, who, um, is the uh, VP of Clinical Development. Um, hi there, how are you? Hi, Anne, good to see you. Um, thanks for having me. And again, thanks for gathering this, this group and bringing together providers and industry and patients. I think it's it's remarkable. And I know we're running a little bit late, so I'll, I'll go quickly, but uh, my name is Faye Feller and I'm the head of clinical development at Geron. We are a late stage biopharmaceutical company developing Imitalstat, which is an inhibitor of telomerase, and we're studying it in the treatment of hematologic myeloid malignancies. We recently completed a phase two study of Imitalstat in intermediate two and high risk adult myelofibrosis patients who had a failed JAK inhibitor treatment. Um, and this study known as Embark or MYF 2001 showed a potential for survival benefit and as well as an encouraging symptom response rate in this relapse refractory patient population. So subsequently we've opened a phase three study in intermediate two and high risk myelofibrosis patients who are refractory to JAK inhibitor treatment. And this study is known as MYF3001 or IMPACT MF. It is an open label randomized control trial comparing Mattelstat to best available or alternative therapy. And notably the primary endpoint for our trial is overall survival with symptom response, a key secondary endpoint. And um, as much as we're aware, we're the only trial at this moment with an overall survival endpoint. Um, Metalstat is not yet approved in any uh, indications, but we do um, anticipate in the near future to seek an approval for uh, low-risk MDS patients and subsequently will uh, develop a pediatric program based on, upon that. Great. So, um, Great. Thanks for having me. Sorry to be late. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you, Faye. It's nice to see you and we'll see you soon. And um, thank you very much. And to our doctors, um, I can't thank you both enough. You're fabulous people and good people. And what you somebody mentioned earlier about the space 
you know, the MPN space is just uh, unbelievable. The community is unbelievable. And to all those who are watching, um, if you ever need anything, if you need to come through us, do so. We're here. We'll, we're here to help. And um, the physicians have also, you know, said contact them if you need them. And Cam, of course, thank you, sweetie. He's such a great kid. All of them. I mean, no matter, I've met, I don't think I've met anyone I didn't like in this space. But anyway, thank you both again and have a great weekend coming up here and um, we'll be in touch soon. Thank you, Anne. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye.